Hello and welcome all my Strumboers out there from the Groove Academy, the Strumboing Groove Academy, and all our honored guests who are tuning in on Facebook and YouTube. Thanks so much for being here. This is going to be really exciting and fun. We're going to have a little short session, probably going to be about a half hour all together. And uh, I wanted you to get a chance to meet one of our Strumboing Groove Master instructors, one of our certified instructors, Jonathan Warren, uh, who's a former student of mine who is making it big in the music biz and uh, playing with Chris Cagle, which is kind of a big deal. And, uh, and he's an amazing teacher. And I just wanted him to come up here and show you some of the tricks and tips that he's got, because I know we've got a lot of fiddlers out there and a lot of interested parties, a lot of great stuff that he has to share for you. So let's bring him up here and uh, please welcome Jonathan. Woo! Yeah. Hello, good everyone. Good to yeah, see man. you. Good, good to see you, brother. Thanks for doing this. Yeah. And, thanks for having um, me. Yeah, man. How is the gig going with Chris? What's going on, man? It's a, all these... it's a lot of fun, man. We're playing. It's it's festival season right now. So uh, sold out venues, crowds as far as the eye can see, playing some some really fun music. And uh, he's nice. he's very much into the whole rhythmic playing the kind of rock country vibe. So there's lots of opportunities for me to get out front and, and just jam with the guitar players and have a great time. So it's, it's a really fun gig for a fiddle player. That's no awesome. That is yeah. awesome. And I'm sure that's why he hired you because it's got all that rhythm groove stuff. He's a, he's kind of a groove kind of guy. And you know, you got to have a fiddle player who can groove because you know, most fiddle players can groove, but not everybody can groove the way you do. Well, thank you so much. And I, I think some of that is is true. His fiddle player before me was out actually Alex Depew. Um, oh, my gosh. Yeah. So uh, yeah, an incredible fiddle player that I looked up to my whole upbringing. Yeah, um, me too, man. But Chris, Chris called me and said, hey, I see that you're doing a lot of the stuff that Alex used to do. And uh, you're doing that rhythm stuff and you're you're doing the pop tunes and stuff like that. He's like, you know, if, if you be willing to work on this music with me. I, I want you to kind of try and step into that. So I'll never be Alex, but I'm doing my best to keep the rhythm uh, part down. He's treating me like a rhythm player. So it's, it's very cool. It's very fun. That's so cool. Yeah. We lost a big, big talent with Alex. Absolutely. We, we miss him. We miss him badly. And uh, well, that's fantastic, man. And, and, I was, you know, I was really curious to know because I've never actually been to uh, to a Chris Cagle gig. Um, curious to know if that all that stuff that you know that you've been doing for years and that we worked on for years at Belmont University together. Uh, well, you know what? Just why don't you tell uh, tell the folks a little bit about your background and uh, how you came to be the rock star that you are? Yeah, absolutely. So I started off like everybody does in uh, the classical world. Uh, doing the youth symphony orchestras when I was in high school and middle school. There I am. <laughs> there you are. <laughs> I'm jumping all around, keeping you excited. That's all right. We're pushing uh, buttons back here. And... <laughs> just trying to pump y'all up. Okay. Uh, doing, doing the classical world all through middle school, high school. In high school, I went to a specialty center for, for music, and we had a rock band come in. And our, our gig for the year, I guess, was to orchestrate music so that our symphony orchestra youth symphony could play with this rock band and it was my first time ever being introduced to any of that stuff uh i was classical all the way um and during one of those practice sessions i guess the lead singer heard some of the stuff that i was doing working on and she invited me to come and rehearse with her uh for a show they had at a coffee shop well Three years later, I'm still playing with this uh, band called Offering, and uh, they come to me and say, hey, we've actually been working on this trip for five years. We want to go to Beijing, China and play music. Um, would you want to get your mom to come with us and like, you know, can we take you to Beijing and play yeah. music? And that was my first time ever uh, being out of the country, my first tour yeah. that I'd ever done. And let's oh. just say I got bit by the bug bad. So I immediately went to my classical teacher, uh, Francois, and I said, 
I have to do this. I, I don't want to do the classical thing anymore. Like, do you know of any way that I can further this and, and get better at this rock music or stuff like that? And she was like, well, actually, I had a student that went to Belmont School of Music in Nashville. Maybe you should look them up. And so I looked into Belmont, looked into Berkeley, felt so warm and welcome uh, from Belmont, learned about, that you were there, learned that Billy Contreras, Contreras was there. I was like, oh my gosh, two monster players that are doing all the stuff that I want to learn how to do under the same roof. I got to find a way. So um, thankfully I made it in and uh, got to work with you, got to work with Billy, uh, both of my my new heroes and uh, learned some really cool stuff. And you know, not the least of which, of course, was the stromboing stuff. And then to see that now you're 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 almost giving it away. I know. <laughs> I had to pay a full four year <laughs> tuition for it. And Sorry about <laughs> that, brother. I was like, OK, well, I, if, if I can be any part of this, I would absolutely love to, because it is something that I, I do think uh, you shouldn't have to to pay an arm and a leg to to get access to. So I, I do think it's really cool. A um, little bit jealous of everybody, <laughs> but, but happy that's to be a part cool. of it too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's super cool, man. And for those of you who do not yet follow Jonathan Warren, you should. He is a monster on Instagram and the TikTok. And, um, and I, I, I don't know, I, I don't think there's anybody else that I can think of who is as obsessed with grooving as you are. I mean, pretty much every post that you post is about the groove. And, and that's why you're here, man. That's why I want you to, because we are all about the groove. And, uh, and I'm yeah. curious, you know, um, how much of that stromboing actually makes it on stage? How do you use that in a gig, on a gig like with Chris? Well, the reason I'm so obsessed with it is because it's not just for chopping. It, it literally translates and transformed all of my playing. As soon as you, I think it was maybe my first year at Belmont and uh, I wasn't taking from you personally yet. I was uh, studying with Billy as my private teacher and he, we would do master classes and you would come in and kind of instruct us and help us out. And I remember the first time you, you showed us the strum bowing stuff. And you don't you didn't only show us how to, to use it as a groove tool, but also as a tool to come up with rhythms for solos and how to make your soloing more interesting. He was, you know, basically explaining to us, like, you've got the same notes that everybody does. But the, what's going to make the difference between you guys and players who are trying to learn this on their own is you guys are going to be grooving like nothing else. Whereas they're they're going to be playing the same notes, but they're going to be frustrated that they're not it doesn't feel right. It doesn't sound right. It still right. sounds classical. It still sounds. So yeah, uh, in, in Chris's stuff uh, and really any band that I've been with since being out of uh, Belmont, um, it's, it's made its way into my soloings. I, I will literally find myself doing. I will find myself doing, getting locked into that groove giving me something to anchor myself oh. into. And I'm like, okay, I have this scale. Uh, I could come up with some rhythms, but to have this tool of this groove on to, okay, -a -a all right, I'm gonna, you know, I'm yep. coming up yep. with that stuff. And it's not me creating it. It's the fact that I'm air bowing and every now and then my bow will hit the string because I'm locked into the grid and I'm listening to that and going, oh, that's a sick rhythm. I wouldn't have come up with that. Let's try and see if we can find a solo that comes out of that. So yeah. when when Chris gives me the opportunity to write my own solos for the certain sections of the song that he does want me to express that, you know, a lot of it is right off the record. But then there are certain parts where he has me come up and do my own thing. And then a guitar player is playing over that. And it's just, it becomes this huge jam in the front of the yeah. stage right before yeah. we, we go into A Love Between a Woman and a Man, which is one of his, his uh, big hits. Um, like that's the kind of cool collaborative yep. thing. It's not, collaborating isn't just for guitarists anymore. You know, yep. normally like fiddle players like me, we would show up to a jam and it's like, 
okay, so what songs do you guys know, guitar players? Because I need somebody to back back me up. Like, you know, let me learn all of these melodies so I can be prepared when the guitar player starts playing Wonderwall. I know what to play over it, <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. But now I've got the chord knowledge and I've got this, this tool of strum bowing that I can come up with random jam. I can come up with 150 jams just sitting here without thinking about it because I'm letting my bow and my fingers do all the work. Yep. It, like this was, this was me freshman year of college, like having my mind blowing, blown, you know, like watching you explain this and see how it worked. I was like, oh, this unlocks everything. This is yeah. literally everything I wanted to come to college to learn. I, I've just been handed the keys and yeah, I feel like awesome. nobody else is excited about this, you know? <laughs> yeah. So, that's, that's awesome. And, you know, I think one of the, uh, um, one of the ways that I, uh, you know, um, get, you know, students like at, at Belmont and stuff uh, uh, really, you know, committed. It's like, you know, you can play, you can play all the right notes and it, and it won't sound right if you're not in the pocket. And if right. you are in the pocket, right, you can play all the wrong notes and it sounds right. Mm -hmm. And when you tell string players that they're like, I'll go for that. <laughs> I'll take the pocket, you know, or, you know, uh, because it takes the pressure off until you learn how to play the right notes. At least you still got, you know, you've got the pocket. And, uh, you know, that's yeah. just, I, I think it's, it takes a lot of stress out of the idea of soloing for a lot yeah. of string players who are, don't come up with like a lot of, you know, like jazz harmony and all that kind of stuff. They're like, but, you know, if you can just move your body and kind of yeah. keep the beat, you can fit in. That's know? one of my favorite things to talk about with my students that I've been uh, getting through the Strum Bowing program. I And I, I have the, the same thought and theory that you do. I, the way I say it is a wrong note played at the right time sounds really hip. But a right note played at the wrong time is always a wrong note. <laughs> you know? I love that. And what I'll do with them is I'll put a backing track on and I, it'll just be in the key of G or D and I'll play the chromatic scale for them, which is literally all 12 notes that we have access to in our Western world. I'm playing it, but I'm doing it in a way that it sounds cool. Every note has its place because it's leading to a note that you want to hear. It's that tension release. Yep. And so I'm, I'm explaining to them, like, you get locked into this grid, you get, you get the fundamentals of this drum bowing and you, you put it into your playing, no matter what note you play, you're going to have, you're going to learn how to play it to make it still be hip. And that way of playing it yeah. is in the pocket, in the groove. So a hundred percent agreeing with you there. And yeah. Yeah. Yeah, man, we should get you over to this NJCU thing that I'm doing in this summer. Um, okay. Yeah, you know, great minds. I heard, um, uh, I saw a little video clip of Vic Wooten basically saying the, saying the same thing. Yeah. And and he definitely knows how to group. So, uh, absolutely. He's an authority. Um, now, I've, you know, because I, I pay a close attention to everything you post and everything you're doing, I'm familiar with your 4G approach, your 4G's approach to teaching, which yeah. is remarkable and is an, an inc incredible approach. Just tell us a little bit about that and, and so that people have access to your brain for just a second. Yeah, absolutely. So studying this uh, strum bowing with you, uh, I kind of... I was trying to find a way to streamline it. And I've, I read through your book and I got uh, all of these different ideas that basically, uh, to me, just made sense in this 4G method. And so I started applying that to learning new grooves. And so basically the 4G is how I think through strum bowing as fast as I can uh, to, to get a new groove off the record and into my playing. So for example, the, the Bo Diddley rhythm, bop, 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 bop. You use that a lot to, to explain how to get uh, into that pocket and, and lock into that groove. My four Gs, if you have a piece of paper out there writing it down, my four Gs is groundwork. Groundwork is basically where I'm just learning the chords, figuring out where my fingers need to go. Then grid, which is the groove on the it's smallest right. where I take the smallest particle of the groove, the smallest subdivision of the groove. So most of the time it's like 16th notes yep. and I will lock my bow into those 16th notes. 
Then you have ghosting, which is basically air bowing above the string on the notes that you don't want to hit. So only hitting the strings when you want to hit them. And then groove, which is when I add the elements like chopping and muting with this hand. So if I were to walk through that bow diddly rhythm, I'm just going to use my open G and D string. And I'm going to go. That's the final result. That's what I'm trying to get. So right. I've done the groundwork. I know what notes I want to play. I'm going to do the grid now. So I'm going to take the smallest subdivision, which is going to be the 16th notes, and I'm just going to get that locked in. And what I'll do is I'll add accents while still playing all those notes. I'll add accents on just the rhythm that I want. So I'm not ghosting yet. I'm not air bowing yet. I'm still keeping it because I tell my students, this is the fundamental. Even later on, from this point on, even if it looks like my hand is stopping to chop or do anything else, I promise you at the micro level, it's not. My yep. hand is always feeling this. Yep. So then we take that and we ghost. So I'm air bowing, but I'm keeping this. And again, I'm over exaggerating it so my hand can get used to it. Just like we do in classical music, we over exaggerate things so we can get them locked in at the micro. And then I'll add the chop to that. And because I'm locked into that groove, even when I hit the strings accidentally, it's still gonna sound just like a groovier groove. Right. So cool, man. And that what you just said there is probably the the most powerful single thing about this whole rhythm approach, strum bowing, um, uh, just th this idea of keeping the groove is that once you get this one simple idea of yeah. a continuous motor yeah. that's going, you can easily improvise with that so that you're not always playing exactly the same thing. This was a big yeah. problem in the early days of teaching the chop to people. We would show people a chop and they would learn a particular, you know, like a, and that like was a, it. Yeah, that was it. And they would, <laughs> they would play that on every tune yeah, and yeah. whatever style it was, you know, right. they had one way of, of doing a groove and that just doesn't cut it. What you need is the tools so that you can make any groove and any style and any tempo, any yeah. meter, all. And it, it turns out uh, guitar players have been doing this for years. It's yes. just this, it's just this motor that run. And once you do that, you can bring out notes, you can leave them out, you can add them in. If the energy comes up, you dig in more. If the, if it's quiet down, you're more sparse, uh, but you're always keeping the groove. And let me ask you something. Yeah. Because you're going to back me up here because this is something that I, repeat almost every time I'm teaching. Um, do you ever move while you're playing or do you uh, just kind of stand still? All the time. You got to move. You got to <laughs> move. Gotta if you want to groove. Huh? That's for sure. That's where it starts. You know, well, I tell my students like this whole thing that we're doing is I'm teaching you how to do the fundamentals. And the whole point of it is to get so good at it that you can get lazy. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know a better way to say that, but it's when you start getting lazy and let your bow hit at certain times that it, you know, maybe shouldn't, that you start coming up with all these really cool grooves and all this stuff that, is, again, it's not you thinking of it. It's not me going, I want to put a 16th note triplet, right? You know, like, right. I'm not thinking through that. No. I'm not thinking about what the notation is of my groove right. anymore. I started at the, at the, I was very strict with myself, like, this is the groove I'm going for. And then I get more relaxed. And as you get more relaxed, you're moving and you're you're falling into that pocket. And really, if your upper body is falling into that pocket, but your lower body is not, you're you're not committing yourself 100 percent and your groove isn't going to be 100 percent. Like, exactly, man. I mean, it's it's one thing to to be in a classical world where you need to. But even then, it's like you got it. You got to move. Exactly. Exactly. You, you how many times have you heard me say Rhythmic music is a byproduct of rhythmic movement. It starts so in your body and it comes out of your instrument. Well, that's how you know that you're in the groove when you're in the pocket. If you're dance, if you can dance to what you're playing, you're doing great. If yep. you have to sit there and intellectually think 
Am I in the groove right now? Where's the click? Okay, uh, uh, where's my metronome? You're you're out of it. You're you're not grooving. You're right. you're thinking about groove, but right. it's not coming out of you. Yep. But if you're sitting there and you can't help but move your body to what you're making, you know that's going to be the experience for the audience. And at the end of the day, that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to push this music out of us and let it infect the audience, make them smile, make them enjoy yep. this moment that you have with them, groove, dance, whatever your music wants to make them do. Uh, it's got to make you want to do it first. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> Couldn't have said it better myself, my friend. <laughs> awesome. Awesome. Well, maybe we should open it up, see if we got any questions out there for you. Anybody yeah. got a question for Jonathan? Uh, anything specific or just maybe about, you know, how he teaches, uh, you know, his gig with, with Chris, anything like that? Um, uh, I'm looking in the comments here. <laughs> They're typing furiously. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, very cool. And while we're waiting for some questions to come in, I just want to let you guys know that Jonathan is a, a certified strumboing instructor who teaches in the Strumboing Groove Academy. He's got a bunch of students right now, but he still has some openings uh, in his schedule if anybody uh, is interested in taking a lesson or two with this guy. Um, there is the, uh, the link. Um, it's not clickable. I'm sorry to say, but there's a QR code over there. You can scan that and get right to the groove master, um, level and you can sign up and take some lessons with this guy because he will get anybody grooving. I don't care. You've, you're just starting on the violin. If you're a classical pro, if you're a fiddler and you're just having trouble getting your backup skills together, um, this is the guy who can who can make it come together for you. OK, what do we got here? Warm up ideas. Uh, how is this teaching? Our warm up ideas. Um, how about that one? We start with that. Yeah. So warm, warming up is, is getting with a metronome and, and getting locked into this groove. And I normally just come up with a simple melody on one string. And work it through my 4G method. I know, every, I know everybody out there is smiling because you can't listen to that and not smile, man. And my, my feet are tapping. I'm moving along. <laughs> and the cool thing about taking lessons through the Groove Academy is, is yeah. you can watch the videos and you can get the method and you can understand it. But it's the application that can sometimes be a little tricky to figure out on your own, at least the first couple of times. You know, you have to go through it with somebody who knows and has been through that journey so that we can keep you from falling into the potholes and the pitfalls that we fell into trying to figure this out. Exactly. Um, so that's what I love about my lessons is that each student is different. Each person brings me, hey, they, they go, hey, I'm working on this song. I need to come up with a solo. Can you help me? So I help them write their solo. I help them figure out. And then I, I help them figure out how I came up with the solo that we're writing or we write it together and we do it with the strum bowing as the fundamentals. And like I said, this this helps with soloing. This helps with uh, grooving and chopping and comping. Every aspect of your playing can be addressed through this lens of strum bowing. And so I help you see how you can do that, how you can apply all these things that you're learning in the videos and in the books. Um, and we get to do it together. So yeah. it's it's a one on one hands on you have something that you want to play. You have something that's coming up in a show that you want to you don't want to feel like you can't play it let me help you let's do it together let's let's create some solos let's create chord comps let me teach you what notes to play over the chord progression let me teach you what scales that you might want to practice to get your fingers uh grooving as hard as your bow hand's gonna be yep. uh yep. it's just a fun time and it's it's yeah. a fun experience for both of us and it's a way it's a good way it's you know as everybody knows it's it's good sometimes you just need a coach somebody who's going to yeah. keep you a little bit accountable um so you know um, yeah, well, there was a, this, uh, there's a question here. What do you do say when people say you are not playing a tune as it's written? 
the sound, you know, this is a, co a common uh, um, concern, especially for classical players. Like, you know, I, I, I'm not playing what's on the page. Is that okay? You know, how do you, how do you uh, work with that? Well, I just say on the gigs that I'm handing the audience my sheet music and they're going to be reading, I probably should play it how it's written. But if they're listening, they're not worried about what's on the page. You know, it's not that we want to play it wrong. But again, it's this whole idea of taking what's on the page. It's just like the real book. I don't know if you guys are familiar with the real book where all these jazz standards are written down note by note. They're not written how people play them or how people want to listen to them. Right. They're written so that you can tell this is the melody. Again, this is the fundamental. And then we're going to get lazy with it. Then we're going to put it in the pocket and let it make us move. So it's it's one of those things that it depends on what you want to get out of this. If you want to learn how to play with the metronome, there's two different ways of doing it, playing only what's on the page and nothing more, or playing it with the accent of the music genre that you're trying to get into. If you play country, you want it to sound like you play country. You don't want it to sound like you're playing a classical etude. If you're playing jazz, you want to sound like a jazz player. It's like speaking British uh, with a British dialogue is not something that comes natural to me. You could probably tell that I was putting on an accent if I started trying to do that. Right. This is all about learning those musical accents that come with different genres of music. And yep. so that when you play those pieces of music, you can sound authentic and you can sound how the composer maybe wanted the piece to, to sound and not just what he was able to write on the page. Right. Yep. Here's another one. Who are some of your fave players to listen to? Well, of course, Tracy Silverman. <laughs> you, got, <laughs> you got Tracy Silverman. You got Alex Depew. You've got uh, Casey Dreesen. Um, Jason is a monster. And to be fair, I'm honestly not restricted to violinists. I also listen to people. I'm very inspired by people like Bobby McFerrin, yes. who can yeah. can stand up there on a stage with nothing but a microphone for an hour or, or two hours yeah. and entertain a crowd. Even Jacob Collier and all all these uh, Collier, all these people that literally their whole thing is let me take my singular voice and entertain you and make you part of the that's what I feel like I'm doing with, I'm able to do with the groove and the strum bowing thing. I'm able to get up there and play my solo with Chris or whoever. And the audience becomes part of the act. They're dancing with me. We're making a connection. Uh, and I'm grooving my heart out because I have the tools to do it. So yep. I feel like Bobby does the same thing with his don't worry, be happy. And all those other songs where he's, he's beating on his chest and he's singing and he's doing all this crazy stuff that, you know, it just moves you. It just is fun to listen to. Like, it doesn't matter who you are. It's just you're having yep. a good time at his concert. So yep. Yep. that's that's kind of those things I like to try and put in. in and we got, my playing. we got so many questions here. Here's another <laughs> one. We'll try to get to a few of these. I don't want to keep people for too long, but we got time for a few more. Uh, chopping with double stops leave a little wiggle room on intonation? I would say no. I would say no. <laughs> Good. I'm glad you said that. <laughs> no, I mean, you because you can still feel that it's, and, yeah. and we won't get into all like the equal temperament and the, you know, Pythagorean stuff. There There right. is ways, you know, that right. you want to be a little out of tune to make the chord a little rich, but we'll, we'll right. get into that in our private lessons. Um, <laughs> but, you still got to so, play in tune. <laughs> yeah. And one of the things that we, we use diff uh, different vibratos with commercial stuff. So practicing the scales. <laughs> You still want to make sure you can get all of that really in tune before you start grooving. And that's something I talk about in my lessons, too. Yeah. Yep. That's part uh, of the groundwork. The first G. <laughs> right. Yeah. Uh, let's see. The experiment uh, grooving to recordings. I think the, I think the question really is, you know, do you use this in session, your session work? You do a lot. Of, you know, you're we're both in Nashville, Tennessee, even though you're across town. I'm over here. So we're doing this um you know um on online but you do a whole lot of session work here in nash yeah um and and honestly the the groove stuff is is what gets me called back a lot of the times because uh they want musicians that can layer um and a lot of the times the grooving part is only on guitars and so when you go in there and you do what's called a comp take you know you're uh you're basically doing the backing track the with the rhythm guitars when you can go through and do a take of chopping or chunking with the guitar player 
it's a new texture that a lot of producers haven't heard before or seen before. Um, and, and adding it uh, after a solo, when it's time for somebody else to solo, playing comps underneath the other person's solo, it just adds to the groove. It yes. just, it, it adds to it. And so, yeah, it's, it, I use it all the time in recordings. And if, if I interpret a different way of reading that question, I also do put backing tracks on all the time, songs that I love to listen to. I will, ah, I will practice along with those trying, and, and it teaches me new, I'm listening to the drummer, I'm listening to the bass player, and I'm trying to lock in with them with my, with my groove. Um, I think that's what that question actually was. Do you practice to recordings probably? All the time, yeah. yes, teaches me so much. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know what? Even though we got a bunch of great questions here, I think I'm going to wrap it up. Just keep it short right. and sweet. I wanted to just, uh, there's the link again. If anybody wants to take lessons with this guy, that's how you find him. And if you, um, if you are thinking about maybe not quite ready for some private lessons, but you are curious about this whole Strumboing thing, you can also join the Strumboing Groove Academy on our Strumboing Pro level, which is only nine bucks a month. And for that nine bucks, you get access to my complete online stuff. The stuff that Jonathan paid. How I'm many so mad at that. <laughs> I, I'm grinning through this part of the presentation, but I am so mad. I'm, sorry, I'm still dude. paying off my college. <laughs> <laughs> well, I took all of that, everything that he learned in four years at Belmont curriculum. of college tuition, put it, I spent the entire pandemic <laughs> <laughs> it's like a mic drop. It's a bow drop <laughs> of making these videos. I've got hours and hours of, of edutaining videos and, and, and four books. Here they are back here. I've got all these books that I've written and you get all of them for, for free. Well, for the $9, you can download them, put them on your, on your um, iPad and stuff. Keep them. You can join for one month for nine bucks. Download all my stuff and for nine bucks so because you know it's for the people <laughs> i'm sorry dude i'm sorry dude but not not everybody gets to go to belmont what can i say so i feel that yeah yeah so anyway jonathan thank you so much brother for being here i'm so glad to be able to show my peeps what what somebody else who just grooves like a monster can do and uh, just walk play us out play us out give us a little right. give us a little something something <laughs> Beautiful, man. <laughs> Thanks, Always brother. It's a pleasure, man. So good to see you, man. Thank you. Take you care. Too. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Thank you. We'll see you Bye, at the everyone. Academy. Ciao.